So today's lecture is on the Tempest. And as you know, I've been in the habit of beginning lectures by placing the play chronologically as a prelude to discussing it. But one of the things I want to show in this lecture is that the presumed chronological position of the Tempest is absolutely inseparable from critical discussion about the play. So it's, it's, it is itself an interpretive act, what we say about where the Tempest fits in Shakespeare's career. The idea that the Tempest is Shakespeare's last play, that's an assumption I want to challenge a little bit during the course of this lecture, but let's start with it as an assumption. The idea that the Tempest is Shakespeare's last play has been entirely intertwined with it with views of the play as a poetic summation of Shakespeare's career, and more particularly as a self-portrait, the portrait of the artist as an old man, the old man saying farewell to the stage. So the question I want this lecture to focus on, and the way I want to try and approach some of the themes and the critical reception of this play, is the question, is Prospero Shakespeare? Is Prospero Shakespeare? So let's start by reviewing the play together. A storm causes a shipwreck and noblemen are washed up on an island. We discover that the storm has been magicked up by Prospero, the former Duke of Milan and a magician who had been exiled to the island 12 years previously by his brother Antonio who has deposed him. Prospero is accompanied on the island by his daughter Miranda and two unwilling servants. Ariel, a moody spirit, and Caliban, a reviled, embittered creature. The shipwrecked king Alonso believes his son Ferdinand is drowned, but in fact he's on another part of the island and is brought by Prospero into contact with Miranda. The couple duly fall in love. Two servants from the ship, Trinculo and Stefano, fall into a drunken conspiracy with Caliban and plot to overthrow Prospero. Two nobles from the ship, Sebastian and Antonio Prospero's brother, plot to kill Alonso. Ariel is watching over these plots and prevents them coming to fruition. Prospero conjures a marriage mask for Ferdinand and Miranda. He punishes the conspirators with various magic tricks and eventually, prompted by Ariel, he decides to forgive rather than take revenge on his brother Antonio. Prospero vows to give up his magic and to return to his dukedom in Milan, freeing Ariel as his final act on the island and asking for freedom uh, by the audience, to, for the audience to give him his freedom in conclusion. On the face of it then, uh, it might be slightly difficult to see why Prospero would be Shakespeare or to imagine an allegory in which this reading would work. What's the island? Who would Caliban be? Who is Antonio? It's like all the dark lady, rival poet, beautiful boy stuff in the sonnets, the idea that the sonnets somehow have reference outside themselves, real life people who can be identified and give us the key to open the poetry. I think that's a mad idea because it's based on a premise that must be unsustainable. It's the mistaken assumption that what Shakespeare is writing is autobiography. That's the same premise, the premise that the plays and poems are autobiographical, that lies behind the fantasies of those who think Shakespeare did not write Shakespeare. If you've seen Roland Emmerich's film Anonymous, you'll know that the main argumentative procedure for the case for Oxford's authorship of the plays in that film is biographical. He, like Hamlet, stabs somebody mistakenly behind the arras. He knows and dislikes somebody uh, with a hunchback. Uh, he cops off with Queen Elizabeth and so writes a kind of romantic tragedy. So there's some very obvious kind of biographical links are made between the person who writes and the writing they do. Uh, and uh, we, th those biographical links may be there, uh, but to suggest that that's a, um, a clue about authorship is to mistake the kind of writing Shakespeare or Marlowe or Johnson or Middleton or Sidney or Spencer or even the Earl of Oxford is doing during this period. People do not write autobiography. We are not in a period where the mind of the author, the inner workings of the author, is seen to be the most interesting thing that they can write about. That comes in a much, much later uh, literary fashions through romanticism uh, into the confessional poetry and so on of the 20th century. I don't think it's a generic, it's recognisable as a genre in this period. 
But nevertheless, the idea that The Tempest serves as an allegory for Shakespeare as playwright has had a long critical history. When John Dryden and William Davenant, restoration playwrights who were ransacking Shakespeare's plays for productions for the newly opened playhouses in the mid-17th century, when they rewrote The Tempest as The Enchanted Island, they identified a substantial parallel between the playwright and the protagonist in one phrase from the play's prologue, and the phrase is Shakespeare's magic. Okay, so they talk about Shakespeare's magic uh, and how that um, uh, com sort of combines both Prospero and Shakespeare. So let's see how this connection between the magic in the play and the um, uh, magic of the theatre or in the theatre might fit together. We're thrown immediately at the start of The Tempest into the scene of the tempest-tossed ship. It's the only scene in the play which doesn't take place on the island. And it's a scene which is complete with mariners, a good deal of technical jargon, and most importantly, the aristocratic passengers who are completely bewildered. Their usual status has been completely levelled by these uh, elemental force. What cared these roarers for the name of king? Uh, cries the boatswain, what care these roarers for the name of king, the roarers being the waves. We think, or at least we think we're supposed to think, that we're in the presence of a real storm. There's nothing in the play at the beginning to suggest that this is not real by the conventions of the theatre. I think that's quite an important element of the opening scene, so that for me, productions of the play which show this scene taking place in a ship in a bottle or uh, under the direction of Prospero right from the start, I think they missed the point, because I think what we're supposed to think at the beginning is, this is a real storm. Uh, then we pan back and we see that that's not what we thought. It isn't what we thought. The next scene proves that the apparent realism was not so. We've been deceived by a theatrical illusion. The storm was magicked up by Prospero. It was under his control all along. The passengers were never in any danger. All was being managed, stage managed, we might think, from the island as part of a plan not yet revealed to us. It's a very clear metaphor for the play itself. This play, any play, events happen controlled by the playwright in order to further a yet unknown plot. We in the theatre believe events that are actually illusory. They're just a matter of a few props and a believable script, but they have no real substance. The sailors, Prospero reassures Miranda, won't even have their clothes wetted by the storm. They are actors pretending to sway and tumble on the deck of an imaginary stage ship. Throughout The Tempest, Prospero describes his magic as my art, further than developing the analogy between magic and the act of writing or creation. So Prospero uses magic to make things happen, just as an author does just as an author uses writing. He moves the shipwrecked Italians around his island stage in order to create pleasing dialogues and meaningful encounters, just as an author handles his or her characters. Like an author, Prospero controls the present and the past of the characters. It's he, for example, who tells the story of his brother's usurpation. He who tells the story of their exile. He who tells of Ariel's imprisonment in a tree many other details of previous events, and none of these have independent corroboration. So he's telling us about the past. It's as if Prospero is inventing all the other characters and fleshing out their past lives to develop the force of his creation. We might think again about a kind of writer or even a method actor, thinking about how did we get to this point. In Peter Greenaway's weirdly creative film based on this play, a film called Prospero's Books, Greenaway literalises this power by Prospero by having him speak, literally, every character's lines. They're all like ventriloquist dummies without any words of their own. It's an extreme but revealing depiction of the extent of Prospero's authorial control. And when Prospero acknowledges the theatricality of his own magic as presented in The Wedding Mask in Act 4, he does so in terms which are famously redolent of the theatre. You'll recognise this quotation... Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And 
Like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherits, shall dissolve. And, like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. When, in 1740... In an important step in Shakespeare's canonisation as national poet, a life-size statue of him was erected in Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey. It's still there if you want to go and look at it. These associations of Shakespeare and Prospero re received concrete, or perhaps rather marble, form. The statue depicts the dramatist leaning his elbow on a pile of books and pointing to a scroll on which are written a variant of those valedictory lines in The Tempest, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherits shall dissolve and like the baseless fabric of a vision leave not a wreck behind. The text here on this statue in Westminster Abbey serves as an epitaph for the poet and their original speaker in the play, Prospero, becomes merely a transparent mask for Shakespeare himself. Firmly attached, then, to this prominent myth of Shakespeare and Prospero is the question of the play's chronology. Although it does come at the end of Shakespeare's active theatrical work in London, there is no definitive external evidence to confirm that The Tempest, written and performed in 1610-11, is Shakespeare's final play. No definitive external evidence uh, to confirm that. We can't guarantee its place, that's to say, amid other late plays from this period, The Winter's Tale and Cymbeline. Either of these could be after The Tempest. It is precisely because we want the play's closing movement to read as Shakespeare's farewell to the stage that we place The Tempest at the end of Shakespeare's career. Then we use that position to affirm that the play must dramatise Shakespeare's own feelings. So we say it's at the end of the, his career um, because it fits the narrative we want, and then we say, because it's at the end of his career, this is what it must be about. It's a circularity of argument we're going to see again this morning. What we do know is that Shakespeare works on two noble kinsmen, and All is True, or Henry VIII, and The Lost Cardinio, a play based on Don Quixote, with John Fletcher after The Tempest. So, so we know Shakespeare keeps working after The Tempest. Uh, the Tempest is certainly, therefore, not his last writing for the stage, even if it were his last solo play, and we don't even know that. But it has been felt to be particularly appropriate that Prospero's epilogue figures his own freedom from the play in terms of leaving the theatre, although, as you'll know, uh, from reading the other plays uh, which have epilogues by Shakespeare or by other people in this period. Uh, it's fairly conventional for epilogues to be spoken from a subject position which is uh, not really that of the character but more that of the actor. That what the epilogue does is to dissolve the illusion and remind us that we are in a theatre and that the, what we have to do now is clap. Let's hear that play epilogue, though, from The Tempest to see why these associations have been activated. So this is an interesting, short, slightly incantatory uh, lines, uh, the rhythm of Puck's epilogue in Midsummer Night's Dream. We might think this is still a kind of magic-y sort of uh, uh, syntax, a, a, mag a sort of magic kind of rhetoric. It's not, it's, not, uh, it's not iambic pentameter. Now my charms are all o'erthrown, and what strength I have's mine own, which is most faint. Now, tis true, I must be here, confined by you, or sent to Naples. Let me not, since I have my dukedom got and pardoned the deceiver, dwell in this bare island by your spell. But release me from your bands with the help of your good hands. Gentle breath of yours my sails must fill or else my project fails, which was to please. Now I want spirits to enforce, art to enchant, and my ending is despair unless I be relieved by prayer which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. As you from crimes would pardoned be, let your indulgence set me free. So the Lexis here, release, despair, prayers, faults, indulgence, connects farewell with liberation, 
but also perhaps implicitly with death. Ruth Nevo, in a stimulating book on the late plays called Shakespeare's Other Language, that's Ruth Nevo, Shakespeare's Other Language, acknowledges that the play has two generic movements which are exemplified in this final speech. Nevo asks, what is the nature of this momentum in the play towards death? Every third thought shall be my grave. That's a, uh, one of Prospero's lines. Every third thought shall be my grave. What is the nature of this movement? Sorry. What is the nature of this momentum in the play towards death, synchronic with its movement towards and fulfilment of a rejoicing beyond common joy? So she says it's moving. The play is moving both towards death, the death of Prospero, and towards um, uh, uh, sort of ma marriage conclusions, comic conclusions in the marriage of Ferdinand and Miranda. We can see a clearer version, perhaps, of this interpretation in W. H. Auden's poetic meditation on the Tempest, a series of poems called The Sea and the Mirror, uh, which are all uh, done in, uh, in the voice of different characters in, in Shakespeare's play. The poem Prospero to Ariel sees the protagonist at the end of the play addressing his newly freed spirit. So this is Prospero to Ariel. Stay with me, Ariel, while I pack, and with your first free act delight my leaving. Share my resigning thoughts of you, as you have served my revelling wishes. Then, brave spirit, ages to you of song and daring, and to me, briefly Milan, then earth. In all, things have turned out better than I once expected or ever deserved. I am glad that I did not recover my kingdom till I do not want it. I am glad that Miranda no longer t pays me any attention. I am glad I have freed you, so at last I can really believe I shall die for under your influence, death is inconceivable. So in these readings and others like them, Prospero's farewell is not only Shakespeare's farewell to the theatre, but in some sense his dying breath. We'll bracket that he doesn't die for another five years. Against this fruitfully poetic cluster of associations, it may seem a little prosaic to counter that Shakespeare's last performed words were almost certainly not Prospero's epilogue, but rather Theseus's somewhat unsonorous let's go off and bear us like the time, which comes at the end of Two Noble Kinsmen. Most scholars think Fletcher wrote the epilogue to that play. So we can see, I hope, that chronology and interpretation start to become mutually enforcing and mutually constitutive. The Tempest must be Shakespeare's last play because it depicts his own renunciation of the art of theatre in the guise of Prospero. Because Prospero is Shakespeare, The Tempest must be Shakespeare's last play. We can extend this, perhaps, to notice that all authorial chronologies are, in some sense, biographical readings. The Tempest is not the only play to have its meaning determined by an assumed place in Shakespeare's writing career. So I'm going to talk about how the, the, the implications of having The Tempest as a, as a late play. Now, readings of The Tempest as Shakespeare's last play activates various culturally charged associations of lateness. Unusually for Shakespeare, there's no major source for this play. We might rather see that his source here, as in the contemporaneous Winter's Tale, Cymbeline and Two Noble Kinsmen, is his own earlier plays. He is his own source. Certainly, The Tempest recaps earlier motifs. It's a retelling of Hamlet in the context of Midsummer Night's Dream, a revenge quest between brothers in which forgiveness ultimately trumps violence through an encounter with the magical. Its young lovers recall Shakespeare's comedies. Its magus figure recalls the patriarchs Lear and Pericles. Its structure, conforming to the unities of time, place and action, recalls comedy of errors. For some reason we don't understand, The Tempest is the first play in the collected edition we know as the first folio of 1623, and that's its first printed edition. The fact that it's the first play led earlier commentators not unreasonably to imagine that it was Shakespeare's first play rather than his last. And it's interesting to look back at that commentary just because it's so revealing. They judged it, having thought that because it was at the beginning of the book, it must be an early play. They found the play entirely to reinforce that view. 
Uh, there's a sense of whatever our preconception is, whatever our assumption is, we can make the play uh, work that out. So the Tempest is shortness became a sign of immaturity, someone who can't quite write a, f a full-length play, rather than as uh, other kinds of arguments would have it, somebody who's able to distill in this very compressed way uh, at the end of a career. Um, so uh, thinking about how what we expect to find in a play gives us... Uh, maybe uh, governs what we actually find, I think is, is, worth, is, is worth being aware of. In fact, we could see the whole of The Tempest structured as a response and renovation of another play of the early 1590s, not one by Shakespeare, and that's Marlowe's play, Dr. Faustus. Faustus presents the dark side of Prospero's magical learning, promising desperately to burn his books at the end of that play, just as Prospero, at the end of Shakespeare's, anticipates drowning his. So, as in, as in a lot of the plays at the end of Shakespeare's career, there is a very definite um, uh, re re recourse back to the 1590s, the early 1590s. Okay, so they go back to the beginning of Shakespeare's career in their sources and their... Uh, and their style and their interests. And one way of reading all these echoes of the 1590s, of comedy of errors or of um, uh, uh, early romances or of um, Dr Faustus, one way of reading all those echoes is to say that this is a play which is derivative. Shakespeare has run out of steam. One association of cultural or aesthetic lateness is as a decline from earlier achievement or prowess we might think Thomas Hardy, Ben Jonson, Alfred Hitchcock, Lady Gaga, Kenneth Branagh, artists who go off rather than on. Lytton straight she proposed that in The Tempest, Shakespeare was getting bored with his art and he couldn't really be bothered with either the characters or the situation. And that's a view echoed by Gary Taylor in a newspaper article headlined Shakespeare's Midlife Crisis. Taylor argues that after a period of high commercial popularity in the 1590s, Shakespeare's career in the 17th century was in the doldrums. Like many other has-beens, Taylor continues provocatively, Shakespeare, in his 40s, tried to rescue his sinking reputation by recycling his 20s and 30s. According to Taylor, then, Shakespeare's collaborations with John Fletcher at the end of his career become in a revisionist argument, a desperate attempt by a worn-out writer to piggyback on a younger one, rather than, as we've tended to see them, the idea of the apprentice working under the old master's supervision. Taylor's argument is challenging precisely because it's so unexpected. Far more prevalent as a response to the idea of a play being late is the idea that it's a summation, a high point, a culmination of wisdom and of humanity. So this is an argument that writers just get better and better and that their last thing should be their best. In this reading, Prospero's own wisdom, which leads him to forgive Antonio rather than punish him and to renounce his magic rather than continue it, occupies an ethical high ground that we can associate with Shakespeare himself. Edward Dowden, writing in a hugely influential intellectual biography of Shakespeare at the end of the 19th century, exemplifies this association. This is Dowden. It is not cheap, chiefly because Prospero is a great enchanter, now about to break his magic staff, to drown his book deeper than ever plummet sounded, to dismiss his airy spirits and to return to the practical service of his dukedom. It is not because of those that we identify Prospero in some measure with Shakespeare himself. And this is, this is what I think is interesting about Dowden. It is rather because the temper of Prospero, the grave harmony of his character, his self-mastery, his calm validity of will, his sensitiveness to wrong, his unfaltering justice, and with these a certain abandonment, a remoteness from the common joys and sorrows of the world. These are characteristic of Shakespeare as discovered to us in all his latest plays. Dowden's argument is beautiful, I think, and beautifully circular. Prospero reminds us of Shakespeare because his character constructs our idea of what Shakespeare must have been like. It's a complete syllogism. One, Prospero is a good guy. Two, Shakespeare is a good guy. Three, therefore Prospero is Shakespeare. 
Or we could put those propositions in any order, really. 1, 3, 2, 3, 2, 1, any kind of order, because the association is, uh, is an assertion, it's not, it's not causal. I'm going to come back to the uh, issue in a moment, which is crucial to that syllogism of whether Prospero is a good guy. We'll just park that for a moment. Uh, and I want to stick for now with the point about the play's supposed position in Shakespeare's career. If the Tempest largely has benefited from assumptions about the aesthetic values of lateness, we think it's late, therefore we think it must be good, therefore we try hard to make it so. Other plays have been pigeonholed through uh, differently pigeonholed, I think, through chronological evaluation. As Anthony Dawson pointed out in a nice provocative essay in a nice collection uh, called Bad Shakespeare, which is also a good title, how many unexpected virtues would suddenly appear if two gentlemen of Verona were proven to date from 1597 or 1603? And he goes on to talk about a, a play which... Uh, a, a play whose sort of critical position and critical estimation is inseparably uh, tied up with the fact that it's thought to be early. So because it's early, it can't be expected to be very good and therefore there's not really much point in spending much time on it and therefore it never looks any better. But if it turned out to be later, perhaps we would go back to it and think, this is someone who's writing this play uh, after Twelfth Night and probably then it would turn out to be much more interesting, even though the play itself would not have changed at all. I think the counterfactual scenario uh, in, in Dawson's case about two gentlemen of Verona sardonically reveals that apparently chronological words like early, late, or mature carry with them implicit value judgments and they predetermine our critical response. If you look, for example, at the uh, Oxford Shakespeare, the, the collected Oxford, Oxford Shakespeare edited by Wells and Taylor or the Norton Shakespeare which follows that text, that's a collected edition which... Uh, orders the plays by presumed chronology. Uh, when I was talking about Richard II, I was talking about how the first folio organises the plays, you might remember, and that, that organises them by genre, uh, comedies, histories and tragedies. Uh, and we saw in that lecture how, in particular, the history play section has been ordered uh, in, in sort of historical sequence rather than anything to do with the order in which Shakespeare wrote them. So that's one kind of organising principle. The Oxford Shakespeare has another one, which is really rather like Dowden, uh, to try and make a sort of intellectual biography of Shakespeare by putting the plays in order of composition. This has, uh, does have the advantage of challenging readers used to the generic di divisions of the first folio, uh, and it does give some unexpected and fruitful juxtapositions. If you look at the complete Oxford edition table of content, contents and look at, just look at two plays which are next to each other, that can often be quite an unexpected but productive uh, way of, of trying to cut Shakespeare up and think about uh, how his work uh, develops. But these are all interpretations which ultimately privilege an implicitly biographical reading because the chronology that we're interested in, the connection that the plays have, is only really the, the connection of the author's life. They're written at the same time or uh, next to each other and therefore their connection is, is primarily biographical. So, so far I've been trying to unpack the ways that critics have wanted to connect The Tempest with Shakespeare, and how in doing so they have ossified a network of often unexamined assumptions about the play's chronological position and what that chronology might mean in terms of critical interpretation. I want, uh, in the second part of the lecture, to think about the character of Prospero, to try and interrogate this question from another angle, to see how we might try and meet the popular assertion that Prospero is Shakespeare. I've already said that Shakespeare doesn't write autobiography. The primary impulse behind early modern dramaturgy, the primary impulse behind the development of drama as the dominant mode of this period, seems to be the influence of rhetorical training. The technique of arguing, we've had this before, in utramque partem, in utramque partem, both sides of the question. This is really crucial to humanist education where uh, both at school and at university, the idea of inhabiting the voices of people on different sides of an argument um, is, uh, and making that real, making that convincing, whatever your own views. And that's a really important piece of, of training uh, in, in Elizabethan schools. No literature of this period, I think, has the revelation of the artist's own inner feelings at its legible core. And, as I've said before, perhaps drama even less so because drama depends on making different voices and different people equally estimable and equally interesting. That might, we might differentiate that from this, a single narrative consciousness 
uh, like the sort of traditional uh, realist novel, for example. We might, though, want to modify this. We might want to acknowledge that in this play, perhaps uniquely, or you, you might think of some... Um, you must think of some other examples, Hamlet maybe. Shakespeare's interest is only really in the main character, the only character in The Tempest that has any real effort bestowed on it, I think probably is Prospero. There are a gallery of two-dimensional functional figures flanking him. We've talked about different kinds of characterization earlier on in these lectures. And I think The Tempest is quite a good example of how uh, lots of uh, flat, in, in E.M. Forster's terms, or two-dimensional characters people this stage. Fra uh, Ferdinand and Miranda, for example, have little of the energy or youthful verve we see in earlier romantic couples. Antonio has nothing like the sort of antagonistic uh, energy that we've seen in villains or uh, antagonists in, in earlier plays. <coughs> Perhaps we should understand it then, like its prototype, Dr. Faustus, as another version of that late medieval morality play technique, psychomachia, the psychomachia, that technique of showing the interior of the character through exteriorizing elements into different actors on the stage. Certainly it's been a fruitful theory to see Caliban and Ariel as parts of Prospero that he attempts to keep in check. Caliban repeatedly associated with the earth, with carrying fuel, with uncontrolled appetites for food and particularly for sex, and Ariel associated with the air, dashing about like Tinkerbell to enact his master's commands and prompting him to the higher spiritual and ethical values of forgiveness. These seem to be psychic functions which map so clearly onto Freudian ideas about the id, ego and superego as the locations of instinct the reality principle and conscience, respectively, so the id, ego, and superego as a kind of version of uh, Caliban, Prospero, and Ariel. These, they, they map so clearly that it's tempting to think that Shakespeare must have read Freud's Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Of course, the reality is the other way around. But the, together, this composite, Prospero, Ariel, Caliban, speak almost half the play's lines. If though there are certainly analogies between Prospero and the dramatist, these need not be autobiographical analogies between Prospero and Shakespeare. So I think there are roles, there are ways in which Prospero has sort of theatrical uh, associations or metatheatrical associations, but, but they needn't be solely with Shakespeare. Prospero's role in writing the script of his revenge against his enemies picks up a long association in the revenge tragedy genre. The Tempest is a late version, interestingly, I think really interestingly, a late version of revenge tragedy. He picks up a long association in that genre between the Avenger and the artist. That association has its clearest iteration right at the beginning of Elizabethan revenge tragedy in Kidd's Spanish tragedy, where you might remember that Hieronimo enacts his revenge through a play he has written and that's uh, presented before the Spanish court. So it's a structural and thematic topos of revenge tragedy, the genre The Tempest works to rewrite, that there is something, there is an association of that theatricality and artistry in uh, the character of the revenger. So saying that Prospero's role in the play is akin to that of a dramatist does not mean he is a self-portrait. But it does allow us perhaps to link him with other directive figures elsewhere in the canon. It's striking that these figures, these people who direct action, um, in the plays tend to be negative ones. Iago, the arch plotter of Othello, of whom Hazlitt, uh, Hazlitt described him as an amateur of tragedy in real life, in quite an extended theatrical image about Iago, an amateur of tragedy in real life. Uh, we might add the Duke, who manipulates events in the guise of a friar in Measure for Measure, Paulina, the keeper of secrets in The Winter's Tale, Helena, who writes her own romantic comedy script with some decidedly unconvinced actors in All's Well That Ends Well. These all tend to be ambivalent figures, I think, within their plays. We might also want to see the self-reflexivity of The Tempest alongside that of, say, Hamlet or A Midsummer Night's Dream. These are all plays which perform inset plays which occasion commentary on the nature of theatre and the difficulties of um, uh, drawing the lines clearly between theatre and reality. 
Outside of Shakespeare's plays, and perhaps it's in these, these kinds of comparisons that we can best break the hold of implicitly biographical readings, we might want to compare the theatricality of Prospero's magic with that of the tricksters in Johnson's The Alchemist. So to associate the magic in The Tempest with theatre need not inevitably place Prospero and Shakespeare together. So we've seen that the association of Prospero with Shakespeare requires a reading of Prospero's character that is ultimately positive. Dowden's syllogistic logic rests on an interpretation of Prospero's grave harmony, self-mastery, calm validity of will, sensitivity to wrong, unfaltering justice. This probably tells us a good deal about late 19th century ideas of patriarchal authority. But more modern critics and theatre directors have seen a rather different Prospero. Irascible, tyrannical, subjecting Caliban to slavery and Ferdinand, Caliban's double, to unnecessary physical hardship as part of a thoroughgoing ambivalence towards Miranda's marriage. Prospero is entirely preoccupied with Miranda's chastity, in part uh, for sort of plot reasons, because her main function is to be a token to secure his own successful return to Milan. Her marriage buys off her new father-in-law, who was formerly a supporter of Antonio. Prospero's antagonism towards Ferdinand is in part a ruse to bring the couple together. Prospero is trying to play the part of the traditional comic blocking figure, the father like Aegeus in Merchant of Venice, eh, sorry, M M Midsummer Night's Dream, or Shylock in Merchant of Venice, or more darkly, Brabantio in Othello, those father figures who oppose the marriage and thereby uh, perversely uh, sort of cement it. They make the, uh, the couple uh, and the audience uh, invest more in their relationship and, and in the end the blocking figures have to, uh, th th they have to uh, step back. So uh, Prospero needs Miranda to be chaste because uh, he, he needs her to be a token in his political rehabilitation and he needs to oppose her marriage because he's being a sort of comic uh, blocking figure. But uh, for both of those, I think his behaviour is in excess of that generic point. This is what he says to Ferdinand. If thou dost break her virgin knot before all sanctimonious ceremonies may with full and holy right be ministered, no sweet aspersion shall the heavens let fall to make this contract grow, but barren hate, sour-eyed disdain and discord shall bestrew the union of your bed. We talked last week about um, Latinate, unusual Latinate words at times of strain and kind of emotional stress in Antony's uh, speech. Do you remember? And I think sanctimonious there. Uh, sanctimonious has just about got its two meanings, one meaning holy and reverent and one meaning pretending to be holy and reverent uh, 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 at this time. But it's an unusual word for Shakespeare uh, to use and quite a, quite a new word. The marriage of daughters, though, is a source of sorrow and loss more widely in the play. The ill-fated sea voyage, which brought the nobleman close enough to Prospero's island for him to capture them in the storm, was undertaken for the marriage of Alonso's daughter, Claribel, married to a Tunisian prince, part then of the play's undercurrent of anxious interest in international and particularly colonial politics, which I'm going to move on to talk about. So one way of seeing Prospero is actually as a distinctly unlikable manipula manipulative control freak. Act 1, scene 2, in which he's introduced, gives us a good example of this behaviour. Because Shakespeare has set himself the task of writing a play where real time and story time are equivalent, so the action of the play takes the two and a half or three hours that the play itself takes, it's an extreme version of Aristotle's prescribed unity of time. So because of this decision, he has the structural problem of how to convey the previous part of the story. You might want to look at The Winter's Tale for a completely different way of how you deal with a story which spans two generations. What, what Shakespeare does in The Tempest is, through, is to tell, tell us what happened in the past through an extended series of narrations about that history. And that's what forms the long scene, Act 1, Scene 2. These narrations are punctuated by Miranda's apparent disregard and eventually her falling asleep, albeit by magical intervention. But these seem like nervous ticks in the narrative, which seem to me to betray the fear that this scene is actually quite boring. 
heavy with diegesis, the narrative term for telling, not showing, mimesis, a showing. So it's he- diegetically very heavy. A huge amount of material has got to be got through. Uh, and there's, a, there's an unease about how the play uh, is actually managing that. But part of the purpose of the scene, I think, is to establish Prospero as a tyrant, physically and psychologically. And also to collapse the distinction between his own supposedly benign scholarly magic and the malign, feminised magic of Caliban's mother. Caliban's mother is the witch Sycorax, and we never see her in the play, but she's an important recollection and kind of compass point in this early scene. Prospero charges Ariel with forgetting how she treated him, and we can see one of the ways the plot is clunky at this point. Uh, Prospero says to Ariel, have you forgot the foul witch Sycorax? And Ariel says, no. But Prospero has to say, yes, you have, because he has to tell us, because we've never heard of her. Um, He he charges Ariel with remembering uh, Sycorax's cruelties to him, Ariel, imprisoning him in a pine tree, and reminds Ariel that he, Prospero, released him. He acknowledges that he released him into another kind of servitude, a servitude that Ariel is grumbling about all the way through the play, and he keeps him, he keeps Ariel uh, obedient to him, Uh, against the threat of being re-imprisoned, this time in a stronger tree, an oak. The ostensible purpose of this exchange, which is to establish the difference between Prospero and Sycorax, collapses because actually they become the same thing. Prospero uses the same threats uh, multiplied that Sycorax has done. Uh, He becomes the same uh, kind of figure. It's part of, it's a small part of a different and more compromised presentation of Prospero, which cannot participate in Dowden's positive construction of his presumed presumed associations with Shakespeare. Or to put it another way, if this Prospero is Shakespeare, we wouldn't like Shakespeare. That we might not like Shakespeare isn't too awful a prospect, really. No Elizabethans, Catherine Duncan Jones reminds us in a nice revisionist biography of Shakespeare called Ungentle Shakespeare, No Elizabethans were likeable in the sense of being modern, tolerant, hygienic, liberal people. Edward Bond's 1970s play, Bingo, dramatises a negative version of the ageing playwright retired to Stratford, a useful corrective to more idealising biographical speculations. But the point is, I think, that the association of Prospero with Shakespeare has tended actually to obscure or uh, misrepresent the ways Prospero is characterised in the play. And it's in this aspect that autobiographical readings of The Tempest have been eclipsed by colonial ones. More recent readings of The Tempest have been less interested in Prospero as playwright, specific or not, and more interested in him as colonial overlord. This is a Prospero who is less Shakespeare than slave master. Since at least the 19th century, the late 19th century, when the scholar Sidney Lee discussed how far knowledge of the New World uh, had travelled to early modern England, the Tempest has been connected with stories of exploration and, more distantly, with the early colonisation of the Americas. I said before that there's no major source for the play, but two minor sources we have discovered both connect the play with exploration. Montaigne's essay on cannibals is one of the ways that uh, 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 a new kind of intellectual scepticism uses the discovery of the new world and the tales that come back to reflect on uh, or a kind of relativist uh, view of human, uh, human nature, I guess. So Montaigne's essay on cannibals, as translated by uh, Florio at the beginning of the 17th century, provides almost verbatim Gonzalo's account of the ideal commonwealth at the beginning of Act Two. The name Caliban may actually have been intended as an anagram of cannibal, then uh, a generic term for Aboriginal peoples. The second source is a letter about a shipwreck in the Bermudas written by William Strachey. This seems to have provided some of the details of the early scenes. This reading of the Tempest as in some sense a parable of early colonial expansion has gained ground in the 20th century particularly because of some significant post-colonial rewritings. There's something uh, about The Tempest which has made it uh, more, I think, than any other play of Shakespeare's, the one that has been rewritten uh, and reworked and responded to. It's it's sort of presented itself almost as uh, one part of a dialogue which needs to be uh, 
uh, which, to, to which a reply needs to be given. So uh, the, co the colonial reading of the play has, has gained ground, particularly because of some significant post-colonial rewritings. Among them, uh, the Martinique poet Aimé César's Un Tempête from 1969, which retells uh, the, the, the play, really um, flagging up the interest in language domination and defeat. When the French Madagascan psychoanalyst Octave Monini's book which was actually called in French, Psychologie de la colonisation, you can see what that means. When that was translated into English in 1956, it had a new title, Prospero and Caliban. We might sum up the shift in criticism by pointing to the difference between the second Arden edition of the play in 1954 and the third in 1999. Frank Commode introduces The Tempest in the second, uh, in the Arden II edition, briskly. It is as well to be clear that there is nothing in The Tempest fundamental to its structure of ideas which could not have existed had America remained undiscovered. Okay, so uh, I'll read that again of Commode. It is as well to be clear that there is nothing in The Tempest fundamental to its structure of ideas which could not have existed had America remained undiscovered. So for Commode, this is a really, uh, in, in writing in 1954, this is not important at all. If we look at um, Virginia Mason Vaughan and uh, Alden T. Vaughan, who are editing the third edition of the series in 1999, just come out in a new updated edition, this is what they say. The extensive and varied discourses of co colonialism are deeply embedded in the languages, in, sorry, in the dramas, language and events. I'll read that again because I messed that up. The extensive and varied discourses of colonialism are deeply embedded in the dramas, language and events, such that they say the play is a theatrical microcosm of the imperial paradigm. A theatrical microcosm of the imperial paradigm. So over 40 years, 45 years, uh, the, the view of the play and what's important to it had completely changed. It's one uh, good example of why you should try and read the most up-to-date editions you can find. A similar shift in interpretive priorities has taken place in the theatre after the director Jonathan Miller's production of the play in 1970. It has been hard to recover a sympathetic Prospero unmarked by colonial guilt. Reviewers described that landmark production, Jonathan Miller's production in 1970, uh, as giving us a Prospero who was a solemn, touchy neurotic, the victim of a power complex, who has arrogated to himself the godlike power of the instinctive colonist. By the end, wrote Michael Billington, the cycle of colonialism is complete. Ariel, the sophisticated African, picks up Prospero's discarded wand, clearly prepared himself to take on the role of bullying overlord. Recent Prosperos, that's to say, have tended to be so extremely unpleasant that any association with Shakespeare uh, would reflect extremely badly on the playwright himself. So, I've been trying to uh, unpick why the association between Prosper and Shakespeare has been such a feature of critical and particularly biographical discourse on the play, and to use that to think about how we use biography uh, more generally and perhaps uh, rather um, hiddenly in the way we think about Shakespeare's plays and their chronology. Uh, and then I've tried to think about uh, some different methodologies to try and test the interpretive validity, and some of those have rested on different views uh, of Prospero's characterization and how they have changed uh, over the 20th century. Next week is my final lecture in this series. Remember, all 10 previous lectures so far, including last year's, are available as podcasts. But next week for the last lecture, I'm going to be talking about the first part of Henry the Sixth, Henry the Fourth. No, not Henry the Sixth. The first part of Henry the Fourth. So let's see how this connection between the magic in the play and the um, uh, magic of the theatre or in the theatre might fit together. We're thrown immediately at the start of The Tempest into the scene of the tempest-tossed ship. It's the only scene in the play which doesn't take place on the island. And it's a scene which is complete with mariners, a good deal of technical jargon, and most importantly, the aristocratic passengers who are completely bewildered. Their usual status has been completely levelled by these uh, elemental force. What cared these roarers for the name of king, uh, cries the boatswain. What cared these roarers for the name of king, the roarers being the waves? <laughs> 
we think, or at least we think we're supposed to think, that we're in the presence of a real storm. There's nothing in the play at the beginning to suggest that this is not real by the conventions of the theatre. I think that's quite an important element of the opening scene, so that for me, productions of the play which show this scene taking place in a ship in a bottle or uh, under the direction of Prospero right from the start, I think they miss the point, because I think what we're supposed to think at the beginning is, this is a real storm. Uh, then we pan back and we see that that's not what we thought. It isn't what we thought. The next scene proves that the apparent realism was not so. We've been deceived by a theatrical illusion. The storm was magicked up by Prospero. It was under his control all along. The passengers were never in any danger. All was being managed, stage managed, we might think, from the island as part of a plan not yet revealed to us. It's a very clear metaphor for the play itself. This play, any play. Events happen, controlled by the playwright, in order to further a yet unknown plot. We, in the theatre, believe events that are actually illusory. They're just a matter of a few props and a believable script. If you've seen Roland Emmerich's film Anonymous, you'll know that the main argumentative procedure for the case for Oxford's authorship of the plays in that film is biographical. He, like Hamlet, stabs somebody mistakenly behind the arras. He knows and dislikes somebody uh, with a hunchback. Uh, he cops off with Queen Elizabeth and so writes a kind of romantic tragedy. So there's some very obvious kind of biographical links are made between the person who writes and the writing they do. Uh, and uh, we, th those biographical links may be there, uh, but to suggest that that's a, um, a clue about authorship is to mistake the kind of writing Shakespeare or Marlowe or Johnson or Middleton or Sidney or Spencer or even the Earl of Oxford is doing during this period. People do not write autobiography. We are not in a period where the mind of the author, the inner workings of the author, is seen to be the most interesting thing that they can write about. That comes in a much much later uh, literary fashions through romanticism uh, into the confessional poetry and so on of the 20th century. I don't think it's a generic, it's recognisable as a genre in this period. But nevertheless, the idea that The Tempest serves as an allegory for Shakespeare as playwright has had a long critical history. When John Dryden and William Davenant, restoration playwrights who were ransacking Shakespeare's plays for productions for the newly opened playhouses in the mid-17th century, when they rewrote The Tempest as The Enchanted Island, they identified a substantial parallel between the playwright and the protagonist in one phrase from the play's prologue, and the phrase is Shakespeare's magic. Okay, so they talk about Shakespeare's magic uh, and how that um, uh, com uh, sort of combines both Prospero and Shakespeare. So today's lecture is on The Tempest. And as you know, I've been in the habit of beginning lectures by placing the play chronologically as a prelude to discussing it. One of the things I want to show in this lecture is that the presumed chronological position of The Tempest is absolutely inseparable from critical discussion about the play. So it's, it's, it is itself an interpretive act, what we say about where The Tempest fits in Shakespeare's career. The idea that The Tempest is Shakespeare's last play, that's an assumption I want to challenge a little bit during the course of this lecture, but let's start with it as an assumption. The idea that The Tempest is Shakespeare's last play has been entirely intertwined with it with views of the play as a poetic summation of Shakespeare's career, and more particularly as a self-portrait, the portrait of the artist as an old man, the old man saying farewell to the stage. So the question I want this lecture to focus on, and the way I want to try and approach some of the themes and the critical reception of this play, is the question, is Prospero Shakespeare? Is Prospero Shakespeare? So let's start by reviewing the play together. A storm causes a shipwreck and noblemen are washed up on an island. We discover that the storm has been magicked up by Prospero, the former Duke of Milan and a magician who has been exiled to the island 12 years previously by his brother Antonio who has deposed him. Prospero is accompanied on the island by his daughter Miranda and two unwilling servants Ariel, a moody spirit, and Caliban, a reviled, embittered creature. 
the shipwrecked king, but they have no real substance. The sailors, Prospero reassures Miranda, won't even have their clothes wetted by the storm. They are actors pretending to sway and tumble on the deck of an imaginary stage ship. Throughout The Tempest, Prospero describes his magic as my art, further than developing the analogy between magic and the act of writing or creation. So Prospero uses magic to make things happen, just as an author does, just as an author uses writing. He moves the shipwrecked Italians around his island stage in order to create pleasing dialogues and meaningful encounters, just as an author handles his or her characters. Like an author, Prospero controls the present and the past of the characters. It's he, for example, who tells the story of his brother's usurpation. He who tells the story of their exile. He who tells of Ariel's imprisonment in a tree. Many other details of previous events. And none of these have independent corroboration. So he's telling us about the past. It's as if Prospero is inventing all the other characters and fleshing out their past lives to develop the force of his creation. We might think again about a kind of writer or even a method actor, thinking about how did we get to this point. In Peter Greenaway's weirdly creative film based on this play, a film called Prospero's Books, Greenaway literalises this power by Prospero by having him speak literally every character's lines. They're all like ventriloquist dummies without any words of their own. It's an extreme but revealing depiction of the extent of Prospero's authorial control. And when Prospero acknowledges the theatricality of his own magic as presented in The Wedding Mask in Act 4, he does so in terms which are famously redolent of the theme. Alonso believes his son Ferdinand is drowned, but in fact he's on another part of the island and is brought by Prospero into contact with Miranda. The couple duly fall in love. Two servants from the ship, Trinculo and Stefano, fall into a drunken conspiracy with Caliban and plot to overthrow Prospero. Two nobles from the ship, Sebastian and Antonio Prospero's brother, plot to kill Alonso. Ariel is watching over these plots and prevents them coming to fruition. Prospero conjures a marriage mask for Ferdinand and Miranda. He punishes the conspirators with various magic tricks and eventually, prompted by Ariel, he decides to forgive rather than take revenge on his brother Antonio. Prospero vows to give up his magic and to return to his dukedom in Milan, freeing Ariel as his final act on the island and asking for freedom uh, by the audience, to, for the audience to give him his freedom in conclusion. On the face of it, then, uh, it might be slightly difficult to see why Prospero would be Shakespeare or to imagine an allegory in which this reading would work. What's the island? Who would Caliban be? Who is Antonio? It's like all the dark lady, rival poet, beautiful boy stuff in the sonnets, the idea that the sonnets somehow have reference outside themselves, real life people who can be identified and give us the key to open the poetry. I think that's a mad idea because it's based on a premise that must be unsustainable it's the mistaken assumption that what Shakespeare is writing is autobiography. That's the same premise, the premise that the plays and poems are autobiographical, that lies behind the fantasies of those who think Shakespeare did not write Shakespeare. 